And now, today's adventure of Outer Scope One, searching for help. The sandy land is our after us. Come back, oh cleanest one. Come back, all of you. You can't leave us. Oh, yes, we can. We're up. We're safe. Wow, just in time. Ha, huh, they'll never catch us now. Goodbye, Sandy Land. You won't see us again. Well, here we are again in outer space. It's all so strange. Sometimes it feels like a dream. We're clean. All the Sandy Landers are clean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they sure are clean. They must have soap where their brains should be. Boy, they sure went for Betty in a big way. Good old Betty. If it wasn't for her, ooh, they would have done something awful to us. But why did they hate us so much? Why were they so mean? They hate everybody. Everybody who's not from Sandyland. They don't bother to find out what anyone is really like. It isn't fair. Imagine saying you don't like someone when you don't even know them. Gee, I wonder if everyone in space is like the Sandylanders. I hope they're not. I want to meet someone friendly. Someone who will help us get home again. Home. Hey, we've been so happy to escape, we forgot all about that. Oh, how are we going to get back? Hey, what's up ahead? Wow! Looks like a lot of small planets. They look like floating cities or something. Oh, I hope they don't hit us. They're beautiful. Beautiful? They look like trouble to me. They do look like cities. Maybe people live in them. Hey, Eleanor might be on to something. It looks like land ahead. Hey, it is land. There's land ahead. I'm going to steer for it. Oh, no, Willie. That might not be so smart. We've got to chance it. Unless we find help, we'll fly around forever. But it could be another sandy land or worse. We're almost down. Hold tight. Down! We've landed! Hooray! We've landed! Good work, Willie. Nice going. Hey, look! This sure isn't another sandy land. Listen to all the funny noises. Gee, there's machines in every direction. I told you so. And machines mean people. Let's go find them. But the people may not be friendly. Maybe they're mad scientists or something. You're scared of everything. Listen here, Edgar. Stop saying I'm scared. I merely like to point out possible problems. Come on, guys. What are we waiting for? Let's go see who's out there. Wait a minute, Eleanor. Oh, no. Not more stale bread, I hope. No. Screwdriver. What for? With all those machines around, it might come in handy. Hey, guys. Let's check out those big machines. We'll probably bump into somebody on the way. Let's call. Good idea. Hello? Where are you? Hello? Anybody there? Come out, please. Hello? Anybody there? I wish they'd answer, like normal people. Maybe they're weirdos. I'm beginning to get the creeps. They could be following us around, hiding behind things, like in Sandyland. <gasps> Anybody here? Nope. Maybe they're on a coffee break. It just doesn't make sense. Nobody around anywhere. Nothing but machines. Off my 
right back. Immediately. Cats make me sneeze. <coughs> Pardon me. You're leaning on my speaker, but that's better. Thank you. Oh, gosh. They talk. And they feel things, too. Heaven save us. What kind of machines can these be? To be continued, next time, a staggering shock. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? Hello, my name is Linda Chavez, and this is my son, David. David is in first grade this year. He's six years old. He goes to a school in Washington, D.C. His class is made up of children of all different ethnic backgrounds, black children, Latino children, and white children. And being around other Latino children, I think, will help him to identify as he's growing up as a Chicano. Because I'm a working mother, uh, I have to arrange my schedule so that uh, the responsibility of taking my child to school and picking him up from school is shared with my husband. Come. Morning. I have worked with Congressman Don Edwards of California for two years in the U.S. Congress. Right now, I am briefing the congressman on today's hearings. I am letting him know who the witnesses are and what they will be testifying to this morning. And I very often have to work late into the night. And because of my family, what I try and do is take my work home with me. And I wait until after my family is fed and my son is in bed. And I burn the midnight oil. don't know what to do about it. One of the things that I do for the congressman is prepare questions for him to ask of the witnesses. Then, besides preparing the questions for the congressman, I also prepare questions for myself so that I can ask the witnesses what they're doing in civil rights enforcement. Okay, thank you. I'll be back. Five minutes. Right, I'll be back. It's okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Alan. Bye-bye. perhaps of the, of the greatest relevancy that come in with any real bite. You're saying that your department is no more racist than any other department in the United States, right? That's what I'm saying. It's now my that turn to ask some questions exist. of the witnesses. One of the questions from Mr. Rangel, I believe you said that uh, there was a problem in terms of Spanish-speaking persons moving outside of the area from which uh, they came. Image is the only complaint that we've had, and I understand that we received one complaint this week. For some persons, black, Spanish-speaking, and other persons... Discrimination is a process by which a person is denied the ability to have a job because he is of a different race or because that person is a woman and usually that job is occupied by men. When I was a little girl, I didn't really think that I would grow up to be working in politics. I wanted to be a model and for a while I did model. And I have also taught and done other things in, in areas outside of politics. I grew up in the Southwest. I was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and when I was 10 years old, I moved to Denver, Colorado. And living in Washington, D.C. is very, very different from living in the Southwest. In Washington, almost everyone who lives in the city is in one way or another connected with the government. One of the things that you realize when you come to Washington, D.C. to work is that an individual person can really have an impact on change and on changing our society. You have a part in making the decisions which affect the rest of the country. time.
have stories, listen to one now. We celebrate many parties, like birthday parties and housewarmings, where it is the custom for the guests to bring a present to the host. But the people of the Chinook, the Queets, the Nisqually, and other Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest hold parties that work in just the opposite way. The host gives the presents to the guests. It's called a potlatch, and it's an important and happy event. Each Northwest Native American tribe celebrates a potlatch for their own reasons and in their own ways. But no matter how or why a potlatch is held, it is always important for the host to give gifts to all the guests. The people of the Kiliu tribe, who live on the Pacific coast of the state of Washington, have a story that explains the origin of the potlatch. And it goes like this. Long, long ago, when the world was very young, a strange and beautiful bird appeared over the ocean near the Kiliute village. All the young men of the village tried to capture the bird. But try as they could, none of their arrows could hit it. Golden Eagle and Blue Jay watched the hunters try for weeks to shoot the bird until, finally, Golden Eagle said, My children can catch that peculiar looking bird. Blue Jay disagreed. Your children are only girls, he said. Golden Eagle's daughters heard this conversation but they remained silent. The next day, the two daughters went into the woods without telling a soul and stayed there many days. And what do you think the girls were doing there? Why, they were making arrows, of course. One morning, just before the sun came up, the girls came out of the forest with their arrows. All of the Kiliute hunters were already out in their canoes, trying again to shoot the strange and beautiful bird. The two sisters tied their hair in front of their face, so no one would recognize them. And they paddled their canoe in a zigzag line, so no one would see them coming, until they were very near the bird. The eldest sister killed the bird with her third arrow. That evening, the girls told their father, Golden Eagle, We caught the bird and hid it in the forest. We want to use the feathers as gifts, for they are very beautiful and of many colors. Will you ask Blue Jay to invite all the birds to come to our lodge tomorrow? Next morning, Blue Jay went out with the invitation, and soon all kinds of birds were gathered at the lodge of Golden Eagle. My daughters caught the beautiful bird of many colors, the host explained. They want to give each of you a present. The girls gave certain colors to different birds. Yellow and brown feathers to Meadowlark, red and brown to Robin, brown only to Wren, yellow and black to the little finch. They gave to each bird the color it was to have, and they kept giving until they had no more feathers left. Ever since then, certain birds have had certain colors. And since then, there have been many potlatches. This was a story we call a myth. The story of the first Kiliute potlatch the first giving of gifts from the people who invite to the people who are invited. Real people, I'd like to introduce you to some real people. Real people. Come on, Martin. Nigel's a snake. I think we're handling him too much. Like we're always expecting him to put on a show. Hey, you guys, I gotta go anyway. It's just that he needs a rest. Hey, wait a minute, Martin. Why don't you make a little bit out of cotton balls for your little snakey wakey? Oh, come on. Scott always says. Scott's really become an important guy to you, isn't he? He's, you know, everything he says goes. You're just jealous because you don't have a cool friend like Scott. Oh, he's okay for a black man. Oh, get out of here, oh, Wolf. Come on, come on. You wanna fight? You wanna fight? I'll take yeah, I'll fight. <laughs> Don't you, doesn't he have one of those zoo shows at the library this afternoon? Watch it there now. Well, it doesn't start till 3.30, and I have an awful lot of homework. So if you don't get out of here, I'm going to kick you out. Oh, look, I'm scared. Get out of here. Go 
Yes, that means me too, huh? Yeah, it does. But meet me over at the zoo show, okay? All right, I'll be there. Okay, I'll see you later, TJ. Yeah. Yeah, he threw up. Oh. Martin, what did you do? Oh. What happened now? Oh, nothing, nothing. I'm just cleaning out his cage. Well, honey, I thought you just cleaned it out yesterday. Oh, well, actually, he got a little sick. Oh, no. Well, if he's sick, I guess we better try to find out what's the matter with him. Maybe you could call Scott. But Scott's not home right now. He's over at the library doing a zoo show. Hey, but maybe I could bring Nigel over. That sounds like a good idea. Right, okay, it's called webbed feet. He uses the feet as paddles, similar to a, a rowboat or a canoe. And it pushes himself through the water. A land turtle doesn't have webbed feet. He just has fairly long nails to help him grip the land and to dig for food. Excuse me. Hey, kid, there ain't no bone in the library. Yeah, why'd you bring your bowling ball for? It isn't a bowling ball. Yeah, what is it then? It's it's a snake. A 30-foot rattler? Oh, I'm scared. No, it's full on. Hey, Rick. Rick. Hey, here, Joe, come on. Go. He has something of mine. Well, we're not going to have a chase going on in here. What was it that he took? My bowling bag. It's very important. I have to have it right away. All right, all right. I'll find him. Don't worry. He won't get away from me. Where were you headed? The zoo show. Oh, well, that's in the children's library now. You go there quietly, and I'll find the bag and bring it to you, okay? Well, okay. But it's very important. I have to have it right away. It has... Well, don't worry. Don't worry. I'll bring it for you. All right? Okay. Okay, my next animal is a lizard. Okay, look. If you be a little quiet, I'll kind of calm him down. Okay, this is a green iguana. It's found in South America. It's called an arboreal lizard. <laughs> Hi, Scott. Hello, Mark. How are you? Oh, touch him. You want yeah. to touch him? Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. Touch him. There's nothing to be afraid of. He's not going to hurt you. He feels kind of like sandpaper. It doesn't feel real. You like that, Mark? Come out during the day or at night? Right, it's night. 
reason for this is because of its coloration. Now, have you ever been in the woods at night with trees, with, with the moon shining through the trees, and you get little spots of darkness and little spots of light? Well, this animal blends right in with it. Oh, thank you. Yeah. This is a red-tailed boa constrictor, and it's a non-poisonous snake. If it bites you, it won't poison you, but it can hurt. A boa constrictor is usually nice animals. They don't hurt people, they don't eat people, and there's really, there's really no need to be afraid of them. In fact, there's a fella out here now that has one, and he's not afraid of them at all. It's Martin. Come on up, Martin. Show you how people can, can get used to snakes. Martin's a nice guy, and he's, look at him, he's not afraid of them at all. So there's no need to be afraid of snakes at all. As long as you know how to handle them and take good care of them, they're going to be nice to you. Snakes have no ears. They can't hear a thing. The way they do here is by sound, sound vibrations. They pick up the vibrations through their skin. And this is the way they feel. They're not wet and slimy. They're very dry and they feel cool because they're they also like to wrap around things. They feel very secure and happy when they're wrapped around things. The reason he's going up my sweater is because snakes don't really like bright lights and uh, they try to find dark corners to hide. Hey, Scott, that was a great show. You didn't come here just to see me in action, did you? I would have come anyway, but I brought Nigel along. I've been worried about him. He he threw up a little while ago. What did I tell you about handling Nigel too much, especially after he's eaten? Are there any other symptoms? No, I haven't noticed any. Certainly, TJ. Not much. He's gone! He's gone? The kid, the kid who stole the bag. Nigel must still be in the library. They say there's a snake. You'd better grab something to hit it with. If he had been found, we would have heard it by now. Let's just go and find it. Come on. Okay. Thank you. Rice Japanese. We'll need one cup of rice. No, we're not through. One cup plus three tablespoons of cold water, too. 
One good size strainer, one measuring cup, and one large spoon and a serving dish to serve it up. One heavy pot with a well-fitting top. Now we're ready to go till we're ready to stop. But one cup of uncooked rice in the strainer. Do not use instant, that couldn't be plainer. Wash the rice, put it in the heavy pot, and add all, I said all, the cold water you had. Let it all stand at least half an hour to give it old-fashioned good food power. Now we are ready to cook, and it's a good notion to get someone older to help with the potion. Working around the stove just can't be beat when there's someone bigger to help with the heat. Now it's time to turn the okome, that's uncooked rice, into gohan, and that's something nice. Put the lid on the pot, turn the heat on high, until the water comes to a rolling boil. Then turn the heat down, but don't lift the cover and leave it alone. I said leave it alone for 15 minutes. Now take the pot with the rice off the stove and dig right into your rice treasure trove. Monosugoku oishi, monosugoku oishi. In Japanese, that means it's so tasty. I'll take hardcore. Choose Mary Frances. Aw, uh, she's a girl, Lily. So what? She's the best hitter in the neighborhood. Well, the best of all. 